Hi everyone, here at Social Ella Ministries, we're committed to glorifying God and exposing the devil. Earlier today, I posted a video about faith and basically how to know when you're having faith in the Lord versus when you're having faith in another source, one that will ultimately lead you down, lead you down a path of deception. One of the things I mentioned in that video was about how the Lord will confirm his words. I want to take some a few uh, minutes of your time to kind of dig it a, a bit deeper as far as how the Lord will confirm things to you so that you know that something is coming from him as opposed to from the enemy. You may have noticed that there are certain people in the Lord called them, and when I say called, called them to serve him, he called their names twice. In Exodus 3, 4, he called Moses twice. He said, Moses, Moses. In 1 Samuel 3, he called Samuel, well, he called him four times, but in, in four times that he called him, he said, Samuel, Samuel. And with Saul, who later became the Apostle Paul, he said, Saul, Saul. Almost as if he was confirming his words that what you're about to hear next is coming from the Almighty God. And looking at um, how Saul was called, you may remember that Saul was working for the high priest Caiaphas. And he was in pursuit of early Christians. Those who believed that Jesus was the promised son of God who came, died, and was resurrected. And they were trying to quell this new religious movement that was starting. Saul was on his way to Damascus in Acts 9 when he had an encounter with the resurrected Jesus. And in Acts 9, 4, Jesus said to Saul, 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 why persecutest thou me? That was his calling. After the encounter, Saul was blinded. It goes a bit further as far as how the Lord was confirming to Saul that what happened to him was indeed of God and how his life was about to change. The confirmation came via Ananias. And in Acts 9, 10 through 12, it goes. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, here am I, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas, for one called Saul. Of Tarsus, for, behold, he prayeth. And he hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. So the confirmation came where Saul had been knocked off his high horse, literally. He was blinded by the glory of God. He was praying, and while Saul was praying, he saw a vision of Ananias. And then the Lord told Ananias to go and find Saul in a street called Straight to the House of Judas. Not Judas Iscariot, another Judas. So that was one of the ways where the Lord was confirming things. So when Ananias showed up, Saul knew that it was from the Lord. And there are other examples too. I won't go into um, a lot of details, but one of the most thorough examples of a person verifying that something was coming from the Lord is Gideon. Gideon was, he was a very humble man. And when the Lord called him, it came as a surprise. In a sense, it was so shocking to him that he needed to verify that it was coming from the Lord, and especially the task that the Lord had for him. So one of the ways the, that Gideon tried to confirm things that was coming from the Lord was he had a fleece. And he asked the Lord that if this was true to off him, to let the fleece be wet and the ground be dry. Lo and behold, that is exactly what happened. But Gideon still wanted more confirmation. And he asked the Lord, it's like basically, please don't smite him for, in a sense, you could say his lack of faith. So he asked the Lord to do the reverse, where he lay out the fleece and for the Lord to make the ground dry and uh, correction, the ground wet and the fleece dry. Gideon woke up the next morning. That's exactly what happened. But then it continued where the Lord wanted Gideon to fight against the Midianites. And he had Gideon and one of his cohorts go into the Midianite camp. And he overheard them speaking about a dream about a barley loaf rolling through their camp. And the Lord gave the Midianites the interpretation. And I won't get into it, but when the Lord originally called um, Gideon, they, he was associated with barley and barley bread. 
But in any event, when Gideon heard the interpretation of the dream, he knew the Lord was talking about him being that barley loaf rolling through the midnight camp. Then the Lord, he was going to use Gideon in a mighty way. And he wanted to show the world, in a sense, that what was going to happen next, in a sense, Zechariah 4.12, was not because going to be because of a person's might, but it was going to be because of his spirit. So the Lord pared down the Israelite army down to 300 men. And as a part of confirmation, he had the men drink from the water. Some kneeled down and they drank directly from the river. But some scooped the water up in their hand and put it to their mouth. The Lord told them that 300 men would do that, and exactly 300 men did that. And they went on to victory. But these are some of the ways that the Lord confirmed that he was calling Gideon. And in a sense that what Gideon was about to embark on next, that the Lord would be with him and he would be successful. In speaking about confirmation, I want to take a look at Isaiah 38, 1 through 9. And this was during a time when King Hezekiah was suffering, almost to the point of death. And the Lord had a prophet, the prophet Isaiah, speak a word to him. There are people nowadays who are seeking prophetic words, and not all prophetic words are going to be nice. And as you're about to see here in a, or hear here in a few seconds, Isaiah gave Hezekiah a harsh word. And it would have come to pass if Hezekiah had not repented, and the Lord had mercy on him. But the Lord showed how he was going to confirm his words, and I'll do so by um, reading. Isaiah 38. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. He was basically in his deathbed. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then Hezekiah turned his face towards the wall and prayed unto the Lord and said, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee, how I have walked before thee in truth and in perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. And the then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah, saying, Go, and say to Hezekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer, and I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will add unto thy days fifteen years. And I will deliver thee, correction, I will deliver thee and this city out of the land of the king of Assyria, and I will defend the city. And this shall be a sign unto thee that the Lord, the Lord will do this thing that he had spoken. Behold, I will bring again the shadow of the degrees, which has gone down in the sundial of Ahaz, ten degrees backwards. So the sun returned ten degrees, by which degrees it had it was gone down. The writing of Hezekiah, the king of Judah, when he had been sick and was recovered of his sickness. A couple of things to note about that. <clears throat> First, the Lord gave a word to his prophet to deliver to the king. The prophet did so. I just want to make a distinction sometimes. One of the hallmarks of a false prophet is one who, quote-unquote, gives a word from God, and even when it doesn't come to pass, fails to repent. And they'll make excuses as far as why it didn't come to pass. Isaiah gave King Hezekiah a true word of the Lord. But because the Lord relented, he sent the prophet back to give him a new word that, his life, that the king's life would be extended by 15 years. And a sign that that would happen would be the sundial of Ahaz would be reversed. Of course, the sundial is measuring time as it went forward. So to, to make it abundantly clear that it's from the Lord, basically the Lord reversed time by 10 degrees on the sundial. And that was confirmation. Another form of confirmation for King Hezekiah was he was sick to the point of death, but he recovered from his illness. That's confirmation. I've actually witnessed people saying that something is confirmation. But actually it wasn't. 
in a sense, they were latching on to something that belonged to someone, and it wasn't a clear message from God to them. So um, ensure that you guard yourself, that you're not looking for a sign. Jesus once said that only a wicked and adulterous generation look for a sign. I can tell you this. When something is of God, you don't have to chase after it. In a sense, it will chase after you. I want to switch to um, Genesis, about another type of um, confirmation. In Genesis 12, the Lord called a 75-year-old man called Abram, who we now call Abraham. And he said unto Abraham, in Genesis 12, 1 through um, 3, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make thee a great nation. Actually, I'll stop right there. When he said, make thee a great nation, he was actually alluding to blessing Abraham with a child. Abraham was married to Sarah, and they were childless. And the Lord made this promise when he was 75 years old. The Lord later confirmed that word to Abraham, that he was going to bless him with a child, because Abraham actually complained to the Lord in Genesis 15 that he was childless, and it seemed as if his property was going to go to his servants instead of his own child. But the Lord confirmed to him that he was going to bless him with his own child, the fruit of his loins, so to speak. But throughout all this, we never see that the Lord spoke directly to Sarah, his wife. One of the things to note is that when the Lord is confirming something, and especially if it impacts two people, he will confirm it to those individuals, either together or separately, but both individuals will know. So you can't have one person going up to someone and say, the Lord said this is supposed to, for example, happen between us, and then the other person just goes along. Usually when someone goes along, there's some kind of deception associated with it. But at some point in time, the Lord will either confirm or deny what one person was saying. So initially, the Lord appeared to Abraham when he was 75 years old. 24 years, 24 years later, when Abraham was 99 years old and his wife Sarah was 89 years old, the Lord appeared to them. And this was their final confirmation. And this is covered in Exodus 18. The Lord and two angels actually appeared before Abraham and had a meal with him. And in verse 9 it says, And they said unto, the, unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, This is the Lord, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. Basically meaning one year. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. I'll pause for a second. We can assume, in fact, we know that when the Lord told Abraham that he would bless him with a child, that Sarah knew about it. One thing that happened before the birth of Isaac, the promised son, was the birth of Ishmael. One thing to note. It was not the Lord's plan to bless Abraham and Sarah with Ishmael, who was planned or contrived when Sarah had Abraham have sexual relations with her servant, Hagar. And this is what happens whenever people do things from their own flesh, and especially if they're trying to fulfill a quote-unquote godly promise, it usually causes problems. The firstborn child of Abraham is Ishmael. Ishmael is whom through the Muslims descend. Isaac, the promised child, is through the Jews descend. And even the Bible is written that Ishmael will be at enmity with his brothers. Here it is, thousands of years later, because of a decision that Sarah made from flesh and Abraham went along with it, that there are consequences to this day negative consequences. So we have to be careful that if a word is truly from the Lord, that we're letting him fulfill it, and we're not trying to help God out. God is too powerful to need our help to fulfill a promise that he made.
if he makes a promise, it's up to him to fulfill that promise. But it continues where Sarah found out that the Lord was going to bless her with a child. It seemed almost impossible, but it did happen because the Lord said it. He had planned and ordained it, so he brought it to pass. Of course, the final confirmation that everything was from the Lord was one, when she got pregnant, and two, when she actually had the child. Now, sometimes we will get something from the Lord and we may question whether or not it was truly from God. And there are different ways that the Lord will confirm it. One of those ways, he may actually bring scriptures to our mind. And those scriptures will kind of tell us that, yes, the message that we received was from the Lord. I share a dream with you, or a part of a dream that I had recently. And the dream ended in what I thought was a bad way. And the dream had me stepping on someone's head. And I woke up and started repenting. I'm like, my Lord, I don't have that kind of feeling towards a person. But the Lord brought some scriptures to me to include us stepping on the head of the serpent. About him making our enemies our footstool. And then I realized what the Lord is communicating. So earlier when I mentioned about the Lord communicating via dreams and visions, even when you have a dream or a vision, it has to be scripturally grounded. So when I woke up from that, um, from that dream, I started repenting, but then the Lord brought scriptures to me. It's like, okay, I knew what he was talking about. And then I think it was either a day or two later, he brought another scripture to me to confirm that what I had seen in the dream was not from my heart, but it was from him, letting me know what he was going to do in the future. Um, another way the Lord will confirm a message is by having successive messengers deliver the same message. I've actually seen the enemy where he will have, I'll, I'll call them messengers of Satan, and it's actually written in the Bible, messengers of Satan coming and delivering the same message. But usually those individuals are linked. They're cohorts, and they're delivering a false message claiming it's from the Lord. And you're thinking, well, since more than one people said it, then it's probably plausible. But when a messenger delivers a message, message to you, you have to look at their vested interest. What do they have to gain from you absorbing that message. But the Lord has shown me things and he'll, he has confirmed it, for example, through multiple messengers. In, in some cases, he has had people from different states or even different countries contact me to let me know something. And I'm like, okay. And that was confirmation to let me know that I'm on the right track. Another way the Lord lets us know that we're on the right track is actually by using the enemy. In Job 1 and 2, you see how the Lord used Satan to afflict Job. Sometimes enemy activity kind of lets us know that we're on the right track as far as serving the Lord. And I'll switch to in a letter to the Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians 2.18 The Apostle Paul wrote, Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once again, but Satan hindered us. There are times when you are moving towards your godly destiny and the enemy starts resisting you heavily. And in some cases, you may want to quit. But in most cases, it's confirmation that you're on the right track and the devil does not approve of where you're going. But it's also a test. Are you going to have faith in God or faith in the devil. Faith and fear cannot coexist. When you have faith, it's something that you're having in God. When you fear God or when you fear the devil, then that means you're putting your faith in him that he is more powerful than God. And he's not. In Luke 4, 1 through 13, when the devil is trying to tempt Jesus, one of the things that Jesus mentioned to the devil was that the Lord was his God. So sometimes you're encountering resistance and it's not because you're doing the wrong thing, it's because you're doing the right thing and the Lord is using the enemy to confirm it to you that you're on the right track. I truly hope that you enjoyed this um, presentation. Don't want to take too much more of your time and I don't feel any more promptings from the Holy Spirit. I do have another video that's coming out that I probably need to shoot here in the next couple of minutes. But I hope this is a blessing to you 
as you continue life doing what the Lord wants you to do as opposed to what the devil wants you to do. And I'm pretty sure I'm going to address demonic activity a little bit later because I have a story to tell. Thank you.